All right. Well, many of you have asked me to get our next guest on the show, and I've just I've, I've, I've ignored him because he just seems like such a big deal. And I was like, you know what? I don't I don't have his email. I don't know him. I never interviewed him, and I didn't want to have to go through the rigmarole. I went through the rigmarole. I got him, ladies and gentlemen. Tom Nichols, the Tom Nichols, is here. Although Tom, welcome to the show. Thank you very much for joining me. But I got it. Made me think. There's probably a ton of people named Tom Nichols. Uh, there's a few of us. It's not. It's a pretty common name, <clears throat> and we're all awesome. <laughs> are you annoyed with? Do you get the question all the time? And are you annoyed with it? And can we just move past the the question about Jeopardy? You were you were on the show many times, more than Tom Hanks is on Saturday Night Live. You're a champion. Do you weigh in on the on the scandal about the host thing? Do do people ask you, and do you give a shit? Yeah, no, I, I kind of don't um, because, you know, once Alex is gone, it's just not going to be the same. But um, no, the only time I weighed in and I took a lot of static about the show is I actually didn't like the um, uh, James, you know, the, the Vegas guy who came in and kind of beat the board. And I'm like, I, I, I think the way I put it was that's about as exciting as going to the to the gaming room at Caesars and watching a guy bet on watching a professional bet on the horses. You know, the whole point of Jeopardy is supposed to be kind of amateur. It's supposed to be the mailman right. or a local teacher. So it's not supposed to be a Sharpie from Vegas saying, you know, I've run an algorithm and I know where all the daily doubles are. And I thought that was kind of boring. The only other thing I'll say uh, that pisses me off when people ask me about Jeopardy, <clears throat> I'll get introduced, right? And they'll say, Tom Nichols, PhD, worked in the Senate author of multiple books, you know, Russian X, blah, 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 blah. And everybody sits there and they kind of nod. And then they say, and a five-time Jeopardy champion. And everybody goes, yeah, now that's impressive. You know, it's like nothing you ever do in your life will be as impressive as having been on Jeopardy. It, show, it just shows you that we're a, like a media culture, that you're not smart until you're official. I actually had a student, I was teaching at Dartmouth, and he walks up to me after I'd been on the show and he says, Professor Nichols, I had no idea you were so smart. Uh, well, I feel like my eyes watered. I'm like, dude, I'm your professor. He's like, yeah, but you know what I mean. That is uh, leads us to your work, really. I mean, you you weigh in on this and and in many different ways. And uh, both your most recent books are phenomenal and so important for everybody to read and to get. But you know, one of the things that you talk about is that you're not good. You're not worthy of living. You should have no life force unless you're awesome, unless you're doing important work, unless you're making your mark and leaving your legacy, then then life is not worth waiting, living. That's a very American cultural idea. Take it from there, if you don't mind. And it, and it, has, it has really obsessed us. And I think it's become, <clears throat> excuse me, it's a generational thing because the older guys that I grew up around, I grew up in a working class neighborhood, factory town, you know, high school drop. My parents were high school dropouts. Most of the older men I knew had not finished high school. They'd all served in World War II or Korea. Um, and the idea that, you know, a hero was a guy just got up and did the job every day, right? You got up, you went to a job, you didn't much care for it. You, you know, my dad slogged it out for 33 years uh, as a blue collar and gray collar worker at a, at a big um, chemical plant. Uh, now you have to be Tony Stark. You have to be Thor. You have to be like, you have to wake up every morning and say, I'm going to smash the international pedophile conspiracy to, you know, poison our precious bodily fluids. And I think I, in both of the books, but especially in the one about democracy, our own worst enemy, this, this narcissism and grandiosity has made us really incapable of participating in a democracy because being in a democracy means just being an ordinary normal voter who has, who thinks about normal voter stuff and people just are not, that's too boring. That's too ordinary. It doesn't, life, it doesn't make life interesting enough to do that. Why do you hate superheroes, particularly the Avengers? What, what happened to you? You know, I, it's really funny you say this because I am like the most immature guy in the world. I'm 60 years old. And I put somewhere I have my, you know, Fallout 4 bobblehead and my all my video game stuff. And I have one of these glittery computers that I can play games on. I love those movies. All I'm saying is this shouldn't be your model for living your life day to day. Uh, and so, you know, although I, I have to say I grew up 
um, I might be more of a DC Universe Superman guy than I was with uh, Marvel, although I was a big I was a big Iron Man reader back in the day. Well, I'm glad to hear you say that because I really I hadn't heard you talk about that, and I was like, man, Tom Nichols really has got a, a blind spot for graphic novels and and superheroes, and I. Uh, that I take deep exception to this. I was a Watchman. I I had I read Watchmen when it came out. I read, um, you know, I was uh, Frank uh, the Frank Miller. I was a Frank Miller fan on is the Dark true? Knight stuff. So is, uh, it, is it true that when you were young, the reason you didn't read Black Panther is because you thought that Black Panther was teaching CRT in schools? No, the reason I didn't read Black Panther when I was young is because when I was young, comic books were made on stone tablets. <laughs> and Black Panther didn't exist yet. Uh, I'm, I caught right at, remember, I started reading comics right at the tail of the Silver Age. So I was like still trying to figure out how the old Flash became the new Flash sometime in the 70s. Uh, so I want to ask you a, a, a million questions, Tom, and we can go down a whole bunch of different ways. But I think that you can take this next question into the relevancy of, of why expertise matters. I thought it was really fascinating. I, I love reading your tweets uh, that that somehow put nuance in into even Twitter, but uh, there's a controversy over the Joint Chiefs, the Chairman Joint Chiefs Mark Milley, uh, usurping civilian authority when Trump was still president by you know contacting his Chinese counterparts or whoever else by talking to his own people and say you don't do anything without first asking me, and so. Even some on the left are saying this is treasonous. This is wrong. With this, there's a reason we have civilian, you know, uh, leadership. And and you basically weighed in on Twitter. It was like nobody knows what they're talking. Why don't you ask somebody who knows what they're talking about specifically when it comes to say, you know, the chain of command and nuclear codes? You actually are that guy. So why is that a, a, a nothing burger to you? Yeah, and I'm just going to I'm going to kind of not even humble brag. I'll just brag brag and say when people say, well, you've written a couple of books. No, I've written seven books. And the ones before this were about things like nuclear command and control. Um, if Millie had that? said, how about sorry? I'll just read uh, so you don't have to brag. Just you tell me if this is true or false, your Wikipedia. Tom Nichols taught international relations as well as Soviet and Russian affairs at Dartmouth in Georgetown. He was also a fellow in the international security program at Harvard. Nichols was the chairman of the national security affairs at the U.S. Naval War College, where he also held the Forrest Sherman, whoever that is, chair of public democracy, diplomacy, rather. Nichols is the former secretary of the Navy fellow, also fellow in international security program project on managing the atom at the Harvard Kennedy School. I'm not even done. So if all that's true, you wrote also a book titled No Use, nu Nuclear Weapons and U.S. National Security. So I bragged for you if all that's true. You are the guy to ask this question. In to. Insufferable guy with that resume. Um, <clears throat> but if Millie had said, and you know, the way you phrased it, Pete, was you said, if Millie said, ask me before you do anything, he was careful not to do that. He said, remember, I'm part of the process. And he's not. The chairman has no operational authority on anything. What I suspect he was saying is, you have to keep me in the loop and tell me what's going on, no matter what's, what anybody says to you. And he was walking the edge there. No doubt about it. The, the calls to the Chinese counterpart, that was all briefed out to the State Department and the intelligence community. And he'd actually talked about it with his previous secretary of defense. That, to me, that's a non-starter. That, that whole business of calling is China. If you're getting a warning that the that the head of the Chinese armed forces is getting a little rattled about how unstable your country is, having you know calling him as his counterpart and peer within the military is actually the completely appropriate thing to do. The place I got a little jumpy is when he said, "I'm part of the procedure." He's not part of the procedure. The problem in America is nobody is part of the procedure. The President of the United States can launch nuclear weapons and not ask anybody for a buy your leave. And what Milley was doing, I suspect, from the way it was reported by Bob Woodward and Robert Costa, was saying, if, if you get any weird orders, tell me, inform me. And I actually think that was the right thing to do. You know, back in 74, when, um, when, when Richard Nixon, um, you know, was, was drinking rather heavily, uh, the Secretary of Defense actually went even a step further than that. And he said, no orders get filled unless they cut, they get checked by me or the Secretary of State. That was flatly unconstitutional behavior. Who's that? Saying you have to tell me stuff and inform me is is on the edge. Saying I no orders go through until they come through me instead of the president, 
that that's that's over the line and that actually happened in I'm trying to play trivia. I'm not. I'm no Tom Nichols, and I'm and I'm going to embarrass myself. Was that Robert McNamara? No. No, uh, James Schlesinger. All right, I'll edit that out. So, <laughs> I, I I like to make an ass of myself. That's part of the show. Um. So your new book, Our Own Worst Enemy: The Assault from Within a uh, Modern Democracy. Ah, oh, Tom, this must have been fun to write, uh, but super important for us all to read. This is such an, imp- an important book where you challenge all kinds of current paradigms uh, in our country. And I, I mean, I just I don't know. Why did you write this? How about that? You know, <clears throat> because I don't get enough hate mail as it is. <laughs> um you know, I, when you say it was it fun to write, it really was not pleasant to write. And, and you know, my poor wife and some of my real close friends who I gave shout outs to in the preface, you know, they they had to spend long hours on the phone with me while I kind of walked through this because I was really blocked here for for a while. Um, you know, because I keep saying, am I really saying this? You know, am I really coming to this conclusion? Um, one of the things you do when you try to write something in at least a kind of scholarly mode, the books published by Oxford, you really try hard to prove the other guy's argument. You know, you sort of take all the hardest arguments against you and you say, I'm now going to prove why I'm wrong, you know, and, and I kept coming back to, I can't make that case. I, I keep coming back to the place where I think I'm starting. And um, that was really hard to do. I mean, I come from that background. It was really hard for me to turn to people from my own world, from my own background and say, we're the problem. You're the problem. Um, you know, stop blaming globalization, stop blaming Facebook. I mean, all of those are real problems that have caused real issues, globalization, Facebook, Twitter, you know, guilty. Um, but my my approach in the book was stop blaming everybody else. Start looking inside yourself and say, am I being a good citizen? Am I being a good person? Let's, you know, the, the, the founders really believed that to have a good society, you had to have a you had to have a virtuous nation. And I'm I'm really concerned that we are just not, you know, a virtuous nation that way. More and I, there's a whole chapter about it. Um, I'm really concerned that we're narcissistic and selfish and affluent and spoiled, and I'm and I I'm not sure we can sustain a democracy on that kind of behavior. Not everybody is is that. I agree with what you're saying here, but but if I were you, you and I are okay. Everybody else kind of sucks. I mean, you're doing way better than I am, though. So let's speak. I mean, you have all these powerful degrees. I mean, you you probably have no concern. I see you with the with the pictures of is it your daughter going to college? I mean, you're not you're not worried about whether or not you can be able to afford that. I have an above ground pool, sir. <laughs> yeah, I don't have a pool. Of course, I live near a beach, so. I <laughs> Of course, I live on an island. Yes, uh, I, I, I technically do live on an island, um, but I. You know, the of course, I'm part of the problem on the other end. And I had to think about this. Yes, I'm now one of the educated elites, right? I'm a upper middle class. I have a, more degrees than a thermometer, yada, yada, yada. Am I, am, you know, are we part of the problem? Are the educated elites part of the problem? And I think that the answer I come to is, you know, we're all part of the problem because we've become so tribal. I think, I think that the main threat to democracy in the United States is residing heavily on the right. It's in my former party, the Republicans, that I have you know, left years ago. Um, But it's not just in the United States. If you go to, if you look at places like Italy, where they elected a comedian, you know, if you look at Ukraine, where they elected a comedian, if you look at the United States, where we elected a reality star, if you look at the UK, where they elected a complete clown, um, you know, in Johnson, I mean, the the populist clownacy um, um, epidemic has been spreading. Brazil, Turkey, Poland, Hungary, the UK. I mean, it is a global problem. And I think it's actually, you know, back in 1985, Neil Postman writes this book called Amusing Ourselves to Death, right? And I and I think that's where we are. We're just, we've, democracy won all the big fights after 1991. We live the longest, healthiest lives. Even the poorest among us are living, you know, longer and healthier um, you know, we don't face any kind of globe spanning conflict anymore. And I think we've just lost our sense of seriousness about governing ourselves. And we've gone, ah, you know what? So, you know, Bojo's a clown and Trump's a moron and Erdogan's, a, you know, a, a, an authoritarian. What's on TV? 
Well said, really, really well said. But what do you say to the, the poor whites who aren't doing that well? Because, you know, actually, let, let's try to do this, too. We're now let's do what's everything that's wrong with media. It's me versus Tom Nichols. You're talking about your new book and I have no right even being on the screen with you. But they know I'm good on TV. So they book me and put me on your level, which does an injustice to your entire career. Here we go. You know, what you just heard Tom Nichols say is is all good and well, but I can minimize this down to you in three words. Uh, racism, religion, and capitalism. Okay, let's go to break. <laughs> well, you know, I, the book is a critique of capitalism uh, because, and and it's I am not, I, I love it when I get um, stuff calling me a leftist because I'm 60 years old and for 55, you know, for 40 of my adult years of my adult life, I was called a rightist and a Nazi and, you know, and even worse, a Reagan voter, which in America is, you know, the, the ultimate insult now. Um, but uh, we consumerized everything. Everything's for sale. We, we made, we've made a permanent youth culture. Um, we consumerized everything. We created uh, a culture where we all have to have a ton of luxuries, uh, cheap. We want a lot of stuff. We want it cheap. We want it now. You know, I had this argument about 30 years ago. I was hanging out with a couple of guys in my hometown. One of them was a union official and the other was a small business owner. And they were, they were bitching about how we don't make TVs in America anymore. And I said, you won't pay for a TV made in America. You don't want to pay your neighbor to make a TV in you know Worcester, you're not going to pay that to to operate a factory in the snow, and and the answer was well those big companies should just take less money and I said okay so like you you know running a pizza shop you should just take less money for your pizzas because people like pizza and they want to have more pizza all of a sudden I was like whoa now wait a minute you know let's not talk crazy and and that's what we've become right that we say I want cheap TVs I want a cheap computer I want a really great car and I want it to be cheap. But when I do something, I want to be paid top dollar for it. Now, you, you brought up poor whites and religion. Um, you know, the, the really interesting thing, Pete, is that if you look in the United States and around the world, the movement against democracy is not really being led by the very poorest people in every country. It's being led by the middle class. It's, it's a bored, affluent middle class that is looking for a big thing to do. If you look at the January 6th rioters, for example, um, there were a couple of guys at the University of Chicago went through all the arrest records. These were all like middle class. They're like accountants and dentists. These weren't like people that were living under bridges, like the French Revolution saying, I'm here to petition Congress for a loaf of bread. Um, this this was this is a bored middle class that it, that it has been fired up by a lot of crazy stuff on television and the internet and talk radio into believing that they are all the stars and the heroes of their own action movie. Yeah, yes, very, very well said. But you do have a whole bunch of lower income folks that are very angry, really angry. And I, you know, I, I, I almost I hate to generalize, but when when you know Hillary Clinton called them deplorables, you know, whatever it is, the Trump. The, I have such a hard time, Tom, understanding the Trump voter because I so often think if you can support that guy, you 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 probably are are like him. You're a bully. You're a sexist, racist asshole who will win. Most importantly to me, the most important characteristic is you're the kind of person who will do whatever it takes to win the game. You will cheat. You will do whatever it takes to get there. Shortcuts, anything unethical. And purely just to screw the other guy. Not because you're trying to get anything. Cruelty is the just, point. Just, cruelty is the point. Adam Serwer, great article. The cruelty right. is the point. And I think book too now based on that. But but, Let, but, but let's let's talk about that anger for a minute because I come from a town like that. I mean, in the but but where it happened in my town in the 60s and 70s. I mean, that de-industrial, you know, I literally grew up looking out of my window. At a, at a smokestack that hadn't been used in, you know, 20 years before that. Like it was just, they eventually had to tear it down so it wouldn't fall on anybody. Um, and, and yeah, there's anger about why aren't we manufacturing? Well, because things change over time, because that's the nature of it. You know, Kevin Williamson is a lot more right wing than I am. Williamson, his answer to this, and he was a lot, I quote him in the book, he's a lot harder core than I am. He's like, 
Yeah, you know what the answer to that is? A U-Haul. Um, it's get in a truck and go somewhere else, which is what people used to do. If your town, if the jobs are gone, go get in a car, go go where the jobs are. I think that's a little too tough on some folks. On the other hand, this didn't happen. And this is something I talk about in the book with nostalgia. People have got to get over the idea that this happened five years ago, that we couldn't see it come. Oh my God, like the factory closed, you know, two days ago. Most of this deindustrialization and job movement happened 30 years ago. There's a, I talk in the book about the people in Ohio still talking about the closure of the big mill. You know, well, you know, people here are very mad because the mill closed. Yeah. And as I point out in the footnote, the mill closed in 1977. At some point, this becomes like campfire stories where you're sitting around saying, now remember, young warrior, to be angry about the mill that you never worked in, that your father didn't work in, that, that your grandfather once knew. And I'll say one other thing, and then I'm going to get off this, this soapbox. When I hear people talking about factory, you know, they close the factories and we want those jobs back. Whenever I hear that, I think that means you've never set foot in a factory. <laughs> If yeah, you're, if you're nostalgic for a factory job, yep. you've never been inside a factory. Most right. of the people talking about this would never work in those jobs because they were they were horrible. And I saw them up close, and all of my friends and my family all worked in them. They all worked in the mills, in textiles, in paper, in ke chemicals. Uh, you know, the whole point is not to end up having to do that. One of the, I think, the equivalents that we still have. By the way. Um, I, I had you on to be on your soapbox, so there's no reason for you to step down. That's why it's my Tom Nichols I like best. But so the one example might be that's still remaining and, and, and very important to discuss. I'm not sure if you uh, talk about it in your new book. I haven't gotten to it if you have, but uh, coal mines. I mean, they are still important. We act about how they're dying and how they're not competitive and so on. But I'm less about the economics and more about it's the same thing you just said about the mill, the nostalgia for the coal mine, but the coal mine is dangerous to breathe and it can fall in on you. And if it does, they're not even going to make your family whole and not to mention climate. And, but it's, a, I feel like it's a really good example of what you're talking about that is still actually happening and people are still fighting for, including the last president, even though he did nothing. You know, the, the, and I don't, I don't come from a coal town. Um, but I, I remember a conversation I had with my dad one day, where uh, he said he was talking about this kind of crappy job that um, one of the kids of his friends had to take for a while. And he said, you know, he shook his head and he said, you know, the whole point of us doing this is so that you don't have to do some of the awful things we did. Um, and which doesn't mean that we're all going to be you know, brain surgeons. It just means we're going to work in, you know, dangerous places full of toxic chemicals and die at 55. And um the, the thing about the coal mines, I, I, I understand the miners saying this was, I, I actually had a conversation when I was do, writing the book with someone who comes from a coal family in, in Appalachia. And she said, you know, it was a real sense of identity. It was good money. It put a roof over the, the head. You know, this was um, really important to like her grandfather, especially that his identity as a man. He did this hard work. And he brought, you know, and he, and he did a hard work that, that helped build steel for the nation, you know, but if in 2021, you're saying, you know what my, you know what I want from government? I want to make sure that when I'm gone, my kid has to go into a coal mine. There's something wrong there. And I think part of it is that those parents, they're not really that interested in their kids mining coal. They're interested in their kids not moving away from them and leaving them alone with nobody to take care of. Which, by the way, goes back to one of the faults in Kevin Williamson's just get up and move because family matters for health care and child care. And if we had better government regulations or maybe benefits. And yet, Pete, we have to point this out. The very same people who say, well, I can't I'm trapped, you know, because I can't move because of health care. Well, what do you think about national health care? Oh, no, that's communism. I'm not doing that either. I mean, in a way, you're always in this catch 22 of, you know. The, yeah, but, I, I quote this book called Dying of Whiteness, which was a really interesting John, book. This uh, guy, John Metzl. Metzl. Yeah, love him. He's been on. Yeah, Metzl, where he says, here's a guy saying, I, I've had years of hard living. I've ruined my liver. But if Obamacare is the only way I'm going to get a new liver, I'd rather die. Well, wh what do you say to that? I mean, okay, you win. 
Well, um, what, I say, what I say to it is it depends on how you ask that question about national health care. Uh, my good friend, Dr. Aaron Carroll, one of the smartest health policy experts in the country, says Medicare is as American as apple pie for Americans over 65. But for anybody under 65, it's socialism. It's socialism. Exactly. I want the I keep the government out of my Medicare. Um, as I point out in the book, and I, I raised this in Death of Expertise before, I still think one of the most stunning statistics there is is how many people, there are millions of people in this country who don't know that Obamacare and the Affordable Care Act are the same thing. And you literally will have people saying, and I, again, I, I reached out to somebody who did some of this polling and I said, I just wanna make sure you know I'm actually understanding this. You literally have people saying, I want my congressman to overturn Obamacare and get rid of it, but I want him to keep the Affordable Care Act. Well. well when you talk about anger, you can see where members of Congress will sit back and say, I don't know what to do with that anger because it is literally makes no sense whatsoever. Yeah, we can talk about members of Congress and who they are and how they got that there. But that so we talked a little bit economics and, and specifically, you know, capitalism and your critique of that. What about religion? Um, well, I, I have a weird relationship to American religion because I come from an old school religion. I'm Greek Orthodox. So for me, you know, Modern American Protestantism has always, like, I understand Catholics, they're kind of like our first cousins, you know, but evangelicalism, Mormonism, Jehovah Witnesses, all that kind of, you know, new American religion has always been something of a, of a mystery to me. What I think has happened is that I, religious self-identification, particularly among evangelicals, has just been another way of saying I'm rural and I'm white. Because what we found, for example, when you look at Trump voters who claim to be very religious, the Trumpiest voters are the ones who say they are evangelicals, but actually have very low rates of church attendance. That 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 you, that Trump voting behavior declines with more church attendance, which is kind of what you'd expect. I mean, it's kind of hard to go to church and read the Bible and think about the New Testament and then say, and the way I'm going to show that faith is by voting for an, you know, adulterous casino boss, scammer, thief and you know whatever he is um but i think that to, that religious identity has almost become just a, a way of kind of a shortcut of saying I'm, I'm from a small town and i'm white and i'm less educated if people are always shocked when i say well i'm a religious person i go to church but i'm not but i think it's a disservice to the debate about the role of religion in america that when we say american christian people instantly think evangelical yeah, I, not more of us out here than just. Uh, yeah, I think that I think that's fair. But the reason they say that is because of the stranglehold they've had on the Republican Party for that is true. Years. Yes. And, you know, Sarah Posner writes about this. Catherine Stewart writes about it in the power worshippers. And of course, Jeff Charlotte has written about it for at because best. Because they're organized. And this is the thing. There aren't that many of them, but they are super organized and they are the most disciplined voters in the world. These people will show up and vote for dog catcher if there's a, a Republican in the race because they think they're fighting a big culture war and that culture war goes all the way down to, you know, the local assessor's office has to be a, a, a Republican. So you're absolutely right that, and it's what's interesting about this, when people get on my case about having been a Republican, people forget the Republicans stiff-armed the evangelicals for years. By 1984, the evangelicals were pissed at Ronald Reagan and they really didn't like George Bush. I mean, they had to be convinced to come on board in 88 uh, for Bush when Bush, I mean, remember who wins the Iowa caucuses back in those days? Pat Robertson. Um, you know, I'm strange though it is to say, and you know, Bush has to say, no, I'm a, I'm a, I'm one of you, I'm a Christian guy, you know, uh, but um, the, this takeover of the evangelicals really doesn't kind of pick up steam until coming into the 90s and the culture warriors and Buchanan and the populists and Gingrich and all, and the Southernization of the, of the party, which is what drove, I mean, I was, I was a Massachusetts Republican. Ed Brooke was my Senator. People say, well, it's a party full of extremists. I'm like, I grew up with Ed Brooke, you know, African-American moderate being my Republican Senator until I was 18 years old. I and mean, come on, yeah, um, but that changed. That was 4,000 years ago. Yes, it was It was in the um, uh, uh, early Cenozoic period. Um, 
when Congress was still part of trilobites um, and seahorses. So, yeah, it was it was a while back. Uh, so, though, if you think about the, you know, the the religious right and you think about covid and vaccination and distrusting science all these things that you've written and talked about of course and then you apply this other rule which i'm so glad that you are like talking about this and writing about this this idea that don't you can't tell me what to do you're not the boss of me I, you're not the boss of me. And it's coming from often people who take orders on their haircut in the military or who take orders and live by a certain, quote, code of their God. And so it's so contradictory and hypocritical, but that doesn't mean anything to them. So the talk to me about how the, your religiosity affects your support or belief into any authority or expertise and why that might be why you're not getting your your, your vaccination. I don't think it's about the religiosity. I think it's about the the um, sense of cultural resentment. Um, you know, you can't tell me what to do because you're one of those professor guys. I, I tell this story in the death of expertise. My brother, um, who was a cop, and he owned a bar. He retired and he owned a bar because, as one does when one is a cop, you run a bar afterwards. Uh, and he ran a. It, it was. It's a compliment to call it a bar. It was a joint. I mean, my brother ran a joint by the railroad tracks next to an empty factory. Sounds so I'd like go it. hang out with my brother when I was a young professor. You know, I'd come down. I was teaching up in New Hampshire. I'd come down to Massachusetts. And uh, one night I leave, and my brother just had to tell me this story later. He says, guy at the bar turns to my brother, and he says, so um, your brother's a professor, huh? And Jim goes, yeah. And uh, he says, hmm, seems like a good guy anyway. Like, instantly, the professor is just an a bad guy, right? And he's okay. He seems like a good guy anyway. Like even though he's a professor, and I think what's what's happening is people with white coats. I mean Limbaugh, you know, God have mercy on him. Limbaugh before he died was saying, "You people in white coats, you so-called experts in white coats." I don't know. It seems like Rush Limbaugh relied on a whole lot of guys in white coats for the last year of his life. But he was telling you, don't let them tell you what to do. Let me tell you what to do. And I think one of the things that really frosts me about the way this debate has been conducted, all those guys at Fox News talking about the experts and don't listen, don't let them be the boss. They're all vaccinated. They're all living in a vaccinated, you know, COVID free bubble. This is a way of spinning up the inner toddler in people. And I'm really glad that more and more people, you know, as you watch the, watch more programs and people talking about this, they're finally just coming out and saying, this is like dealing with toddlers. And I think it is the infantilization of American society that goes back to this problem that I talk about in the book, about narcissism, about abundance, about years of really not having, I'm, even, I know, you know, Pete, you're going to say there are people who are suffering and in poor towns, but even there, you know, you're still talking about people who are like, hey, I want to have ESPN. Like, I don't want to make hard choices. I want to live the way I want to live. And the government's job is to give that to me. And if people can't do that, and they do anything that inconveniences me, telling me to get a shot, telling me I have to wear a mask, telling me that I have to, you know, get up and do things in the morning, um, then democracy is a failure. Well, I agree with all that. And I think, you know, you could be as nuanced as you want to talk about those poor folks and, and be more specific about why that's the case. I think that's I think there's a lot of truth to that. But how do you solve for Norway without coming to my third point that I try to make in our soundbite, everything that's wrong with cable news media earlier, which was uh, capitalism, religion and racism? How, how is it not just racism and when i say norway i mean they're super racist but they're also very comfortable gender equity is a really important thing uh but they don't have a lot of diversity they don't have a pluralistic culture and when they start to a guy goes and kills like 100 kids on an island i mean there's certainly that that part of that thread of, of of there but but the my point is they're very rich and there's not as much wealth inequality and and they are not us they still understand support institutions democracy science and they're even getting rid of Apparently, they're cutting down on their greatest natural resource, which is which is oil. They're 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 doing. Yeah, I mean, it, but you have to be careful about comparing, you know, tiny homogeneous countries like Norway 
to gigantic multicultural nations like the United States. And also because, uh, you know, there's a cultural issue. I mean, Norway has a different public and civic culture than we do. You know, there's a there's an old joke. Um, uh, do I have time to tell a joke? Um, there's I've, got a, go, I've, I've got to go to break and get to use Hannity. I'm not going anywhere. I'm in my fucking shed. <laughs> Well, there's an old joke about, uh, you know, in, in, in my days as a Soviet expert, you know, uh, that uh, this the chief of the Soviet general staff is worried about how they how are they going to fight China? Right. You know, back when they're in trouble with China and his aide says, well, you know, comrade general, look at, you know, two million Israelis have held off 200 million Arabs. You know, it can be done. And um, this uh, general thinks for me. He says, yes, good point. He says, but do we have enough Jews? Um <laughs> And, and so when you bring this up, you know, it's like, well, do we have enough Norwegians? That's not the point. The point is you have the culture that, that you have. Um, I think that race, I think a lot of this is white anxiety. And I think some of it is a, I'm going to even go further because I point this out in the book about culture. There's a certain amount of self-loathing in, in the culture among whites because they are participants in it. Um, it's not like, I mean, they are. I talk, I'm surprised that more people haven't zeroed in on this in the book because I thought it would be more controversial. But, you know, 30 years ago, the New Republic had a great cover story called The Real Face of Rap. And it was this like, the cover was a, this white kid with blonde hair and a rugby shirt and freckles, you know. And I think there's this attitude of, you know, we've kind of brought this on ourselves that we have created a multicultural culture and we participated in it and we like it. And now we're feeling demographically threatened by it. And so we have to go scapegoat people. We have to scapegoat people of color. We have to scapegoat immigrants. Um, we have to pretend that we didn't really, you know, like living in a multi. It's kind of like the people who talk about the decadence of America while ignoring the, you know, gigantic multi gazillion dollar porn industry. Right. Um, Drugs. Or, or, or gambling. When people say, well, you know, we're we're strapped as a country. I'm like, not to judge by sports and gambling, we're not strapped. We seem to have plenty of money for that. Well, you could say that of all the black market activity, porn, gambling, sex. But it's uh, not black market. It's white market. It's it's legal. Uh, and drugs. But it's also ill. You're right. Obviously, that's getting counted to legalize gambling. But I'm talking about the illegal things, whether it be sex work or drugs, especially that people are spending. There's no way to chart how much they're spending. But, but I, as I point out in the book, one of the only companies that can rival the reach of Facebook, uh, Microsoft, Twitter, you know, all of these big Pornhub. It's a gigantic amount of traffic and a gigantic reach. Now, I, I'm, and I don't say this as, you know, a crusader against porn. I'm simply pointing out when you're saying what's wrong with America, why are we making, you know, who did this to us? Well, I don't know. Um, you know, make, who, who, who keeps making these stupid choices? Ask the consumers. Who keeps putting uh, yeah. these, you know, who keeps putting these people into office? Ask the voters as if it's magic. Like we crossed the street one day and we got hit by a bus and all of a sudden, you know, Congress was full of lunatics and, you know, uh, sports betting was a multi gazillion dollar industry like it was magic and, and nobody knew knows how it happened. It happened because we wanted it to happen. Pornhub is a uh, porn website. Is that what that is? Uh, so I'm told. Let me just just putting down my notes. So why the phrase white anxiety? My black friends say they don't like that. They say it's called racism. Why do you use yeah, that? Well, it is, it, but it's, you don't have to use these terms exclusively because there is a demographic anxiety among and, um, um, some of my colleagues at the Atlantic, people like Ann Applebaum pointed out and Yoni Applebaum as well. Ann wrote a book about the twilight of democracy with this sense, you know, that people are losing power in, in the middle class in places like England and Italy. Um, Yoni had a great piece about it's never happened before that the dominant group has just lost power through kind of demographic change like this. We've, we've just not seen this happen where, you know, white Christian America and, and other people have written about it, too. There's a book by Robert Jones and others um, where white white Christians are looking ahead to within their lifetime or certainly within their children's lifetime where they are merely a plurality rather than a majority of the country. And it freaks them out. 
Um, and you know, change freaks everybody out. I mean, I'm an, I'm an old white guy. I, I, when I get on the subway, I look around and I say, wow, this looks different than 1980. Um, it doesn't bother me, but I notice it. It, it makes me aware of my age. Um, but I think for some people, they, this has been weaponized by political entrepreneurs who say this demographic change, the people that are coming up, they hate you. They're going to kill you. They're going to take things away from you when in fact, and again, it's, it appeals to that inner narcissism. You, 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 you are so important. Um, Think of it with the vaccines, right? You are so important that Bill Gates needs to get microchips into your bloodstream because he needs to know where you are. Like you matter that much. Um, (laughs) But that is, that is the, you know, that is the new dominant cultural ethos. I matter and everyone's out to get me because I'm, you know, the last defender of white Christian civilization in a way that people didn't think about 30 years ago. One, one more question, Tom, and I could talk to you forever. The books are so good, and I hope that you're impressed enough to make a stop here again uh, at some time in the future because I'm really enjoying it. But, you know, we, we talk so much about black on white. You know, we talk about race and, and, and the original sin of America. Uh, and I wanted to just I, I think immigration there's there's an overlap there because it's what you talked about in terms of you know kind of a xenophobic thing but immigration is interesting because if you look in at at economics and if you look at the special interest groups that you know spend money on politicians they're overwhelmingly in support there's there's wide disagreement that immigration is really good for the economy maybe maybe there is and maybe i'm missing something but but there is so much fear of of folks coming in and working and yet there's so much work apparently to be had what about the issue of of immigration and how is that constantly an animating and by the way if only in 2013 the house would have taken up a vote on the senate's that passed a comprehensive immigration bill so there would be so much different paradigm here but what about that issue well, I, and I'll go, you know, this is where I'll do my old guy thing and say, and if we had actually taken seriously all the things we said we were going to do after the 1986 amnesty, which we're talking 35 years ago now. So, I mean, our immigration system is a mess. I mean, we just are not competent at this and we can't forge a bipartisan solution on it. Um, but the Republicans used to be a pro-immigration party. America was a pro-immigration country. What's interesting, again, is because this has been weaponized as a racial issue, um, you have people in Montana and Iowa worrying about immigrants on the border of Texas because they're saying, oh, you know, people, you know, what's your big fear up here in, you know, voting in northern New Hampshire? Oh, it's uh, illegal immigrants flooding into America. Do you know any? Are there any in your town? No. No. and so it's become a, again, it's become a kind of a placeholder for issues about race. And it, it is absolutely true that a lot of the people who are coming in are doing things. This is the old saw about doing jobs Americans won't do. But the fact of the matter is, these are jobs. This is like, it goes back to what we're talking about with factories, right? I wish the fact, you know what they need to bring back to my town? Good chicken slaughtering jobs. Those were good high paid jobs. Uh, no, I'm not doing it. And my kids aren't doing it, but somebody should do it in my town, you know? Um, and so I think that the the immigration issue on which the Democrats have been completely tone deaf and which the Republicans have racialized into, again, that we're talking about white anxiety. You know, my hometown, if you talk to people from my hometown, they will, even though that most of the people my age that I went to high school with, they did well, they prospered. You know, a lot of them didn't go to college. They didn't have to. They did. They did. But you know what they're really upset about? That the local, and I say this in the book, that the local barber shop is now a Spanish church. That's, yeah, that just it just rubs them the wrong way, and I'm like, okay, but you know, the wasps who lived here a hundred years before did not appreciate the Polish speaking church, you know, and the filthy garlic eaters, and you know, the 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 Greeks and their greasy mustaches setting up churches. This is part of how things change. And they're like, no, this is different. This is, this has to, and I'm like, okay, then, you know, then I notice you don't live in this neighborhood. Cause that's the other thing is all the guys from my old neighborhood who complain in the neighborhood don't live there anymore. Yeah. Chicopee, right? Massachusetts. Chicopee, Mass, yeah. All right, Tom, I'll let you go. Do you want to do a one uh, uh, Jeopardy question? Sure. Hit me. 
this singer, this singer was homeless for the year before her big break, winning an amateur contest at the Apollo Theater in 1934. Billie Holiday? That's a great guess. Yeah. Who is? Um, uh, geez, I don't know. I, mean, I could start really cycling through um, you know, Blossom Deary or Ella Fitzgerald. Oh, okay. Way, good one. I, I, I just love to be able to play the role of the host where I tell you it's a good guess because it's always oh, I would have known that. So, I know you get that. You know, Alex, Alex had that kind of he, he once asked, uh, you know, do I do you guys think I make the contestants? We were at a contestant try. I said, wait, you don't think I make the contestants feel stupid, do you? And we all kind of, we were all sitting there going, <laughs> yeah, yeah, Alex. Dude, it's so great to finally talk to you. Uh, I love yeah, Thanks for having me, Pete. I hope everybody gets them. Uh, our own worst enemy uh, is so, so good. And uh, so depth of expertise is, is so uh, amazing. It's such both important. I hope you'll join me again. And I'd love to have you at one of our live Anytime. events. And really great to talk to you. Thanks, Pete.